Well, good morning. He is faithful, and I love that song. It has that word compassion in it. He's also a very compassionate God, and we've needed compassion. This has been, you know, what everybody would call a difficult year, hadn't it? Has everybody had great ease through this year? I know even, uh, even as a church, you know, I look out, and there's, uh, we're socially distanced because there's a lot of people who still haven't made it back for obvious reasons and probably good reasons in terms of their personal health. And so if uh, you're one of our own and watching at home, we welcome you. And if uh, you've just stumbled on us on your, on your webpage, we're excited to see you. I'm beginning a new series these next several weeks uh, till Christmas called uh, All I Want for Christmas. Uh, we just finished uh, about a grateful heart, but I love the phrase, all I want for Christmas. Have you ever, I remember the first time kind of this, this came, came to mind, um, you know, everybody always says, what do you want for Christmas? And so you're supposed to say, well, all I want for Christmas, and there, then there was a song. Do you remember the song? All I want for Christmas is my two front teeth. Remember that? I remember the first time my dad showed me that, and he just thought that was the funniest thing. And I was a little guy, and, and so uh, we, for years, would say Merry Christmas <laughs> to each other, and always with a whistle. I mean for years, like up until his death, it was Merry Christmas. And, uh, and I hope that's not all we want for Christmas. I, I do also remember uh, when my dad passed away, passed away in May, and uh, they had a writing assignment for the kids in school. And the, the assignment was, uh, if you could have anything you want for Christmas, what would it be? And Logan, uh, when he finished that sentence and wrote about it, he said, I would love to have my grandpa Corky back for Christmas. And I thought, man, that's awesome. That is awesome when some, most kids are thinking about something else there was something compassionate that hit his heart so it has been a tough year and one of the things that we need is the presence of God so that's what I've entitled this morning is the presence of God and that's what we need and that's that's what we long for and that's what we hope for matter of fact I was thinking about this whole year and uh, I had this thought that only I would have that I probably shouldn't share uh, and it was I thought if if this year was a song, what would it be? I mean, if it was a drink, what would it be? You know how you, sometimes you make a song and, and sometimes you, 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 know, you have different things. If, if this year was a drink, what would it be? It would be that concoction they gave you just before you get a colonoscopy. <laughs> right? That's what it would be. I mean, you have to drink all that stuff down and you think it's over, but it's not. You know, something else comes. And it's been, that's been a kind of year it's been. So, it, you know, that's the name I would give it. And so I, I got to thinking, uh, what do we need? Certainly we need hope, and the Advent talks about that. And a part of hope is compassion, to have a deep compassion. And then one of the things that we get with the presence of God is his deep empathy for us. Sometimes we don't talk enough about the empathetic heart of God, but how caring he is and how he cares for us. In Isaiah 9, 6, Isaiah uh, is called the Shakespeare of the prophets. There is more about Jesus and Jesus' coming and his coming again. As a matter of fact, most of what you read in Isaiah, he will talk about the coming of Jesus the Christ when he means the Christ child, but he also talks about, usually in the same prophetic way, he talks about his coming again. And, uh, you know, in, in Isaiah 64, he, he talks extensively about God coming again and about what God is going to do and how he is going to turn weapons into plowshares. And one of the things that he's going to do during that millennial reign that we will be in is he will care for uh, us. And we are like clay in the potter's hand. And we will all be made new in a completely different way. But the prophet's language is very precise. Uh, the Christ child had to be born to come to be with us, and it is, it is also the same 
pre-existing Christ. See, a lot of people have this misunderstanding about baby Jesus. They think that that is the first infusion of God into our world. The baby Jesus was a manifestation of the pre-existing Christ. He didn't begin in Bethlehem. He began in eternity past with God, with the Holy Spirit. And so what we see in flesh is God incarnate. And he talks about this. He says, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will, be upon, will rest upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So in this, we, we see Isaiah doing that very thing. He talks about the initial coming of Christ as he comes in a, in a in a stall in Bethlehem, as he comes in a humble, humble way, the most humble way a person can enter the world is as a, as a baby. And he comes as this baby child, but he also moves quickly from that to his second coming, the one that we now await. And when he comes the next time, uh, he will be the Prince of Peace, the King of King. Every Man will bow, every tongue will confess. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. So the next time he comes, he comes to rule and reign. Still the pre-existing Christ. So Isaiah then in chapter 7, verse 14, uh, he gives us, uh, Isaiah talks about our Emmanuel. And Isaiah is using the most intimate kind of language to describe the presence of God's coming. And he does this 700 years before Christ came. There was that 400 years that, uh, that we just heard about, uh, that Mark was talking about, where the, the Bible is silent for 400 years. Isaiah was living 700 years before Christ. And 700 years before this occurs, he talks about it. And he says, All right then, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the virgin, don't miss that. The virgin will conceive a child. That's very intimate language. And it's about the, the, the formation of, of the Christ child in the womb of Mary. And Joseph was assigned to be his father figure, but it was not. Joseph that was his father. He is in the lineage of David, but it is not anybody in that lineage. And so you see, he says, the virgin will conceive a child, and she will give birth to a son, and we will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. There's no greater words that can be spoken of hope than God with us. The desire of the human heart is to have God with them. The great Billy Graham used to say that man is born with a God void in his heart. And throughout his life, no matter what he does or what he appears to do to fill his heart, it is only Christ that can fill the heart. It is the presence of God that every man longs for. As a matter of fact, it is, it is hope is the very nature and essence of who Jesus is. And so we long for his presence. Now in Matthew, this was such a wonderful truth, it was worth repeating by Matthew in his Gospels. Uh, and this is the complete fulfillment that had been prophesied by Isaiah. God with us as a baby in the manger is the essence of what Christmas is all about. That's what Christmas celebrates. The same thing. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. And she will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God is with us. Now, you can look in Matthew, and I encourage you to. The first part of Matthew, all the way up to verse 23 there, is all the lineage. It's all the names of the people that, that were in existence that was in the lineage of who Jesus was. You see, Jesus had to come from, from the tribe of David, from the lineage of David. And that's why, uh, that's one of the things that they they checked on in terms of his messiahship. But in Matthew, he's very careful when he gets to Joseph. He talks about Mary. 
talks about Mary being Jesus' mother, and then he says, Joseph, Mary's husband. Not Jesus' father, but Mary's husband. The man who was given that responsibility to father this child, who did quite a good job, as a matter of fact. How, how would you like to have a perfect son? Think about that for a minute. I never experienced that. My children were not perfect. I, matter of fact, I remember when God was calling me into ministry, I sat my then teenage boys down and I said, Now guys, I don't want you to be any different than you are. I don't want the fact that I am now on staff of a church, I don't want that to color your behavior in any way. I want you to be you. Do you understand that? Got it, Dad. After about four weeks, I took him aside and said, Can you not be you for a little while? But can you imagine having a child that had no sin? Or being in that family, being a brother or a sister of a child without sin? A brother or a sister who didn't sin? I was in that kind of family. Whatever sin Larry did, he got away with. I'm telling you, that our family thought that child was perfect. And it's hard growing up. That's why, that's why the brother of Jesus, James, doesn't come to know Christ as his Savior until after Jesus is gone for a year. I get it. I get it. All I ever heard my whole life was Larry, Larry, Larry. Well, Larry never did that. Larry never broke that. Larry didn't do that. Larry cleaned himself. Larry, 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 Larry. Right? It's hard. But he was the sinless son of God. So fascinating to think about that. Think about what that, that must have been like and the family dynamic and the comfort he brought even as a child. Because our children, even our honorary children, bring us comfort from time to time. And, and, and it, just the, the idea of being his mother and father is interesting. So I want to take you to some comfort. I want to show you what the Apostle Paul had to say about comfort. Christmas is a great time to think about the comfort the comfort that we have from God, the comfort that can only come from him. There's only so much that we can do to one another or for one another, and we should do it. Uh, and yet, the comfort of God, the comfort of knowing him. And as we go into this season, it's important for us to think about that comfort in our lives and in the lives of others. Uh, the comfort starts with praise. And in this verse, he's going to give us the source, the reason, and the experience. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, and this is kind of some of my favorite scripture because of what it represents. Paul is talking to this church at Corinth, and then he comes up with almost what is a tongue twister. He says, I praise, all praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. There's your source. He starts by praising God for the comfort he has given us. At Christmas, what a wonderful way to think about how to celebrate Christmas. To first, make sure that you are praising God the Father for the Son. Knowing that God the Son is the source for us. The source of, of all comfort. And then he goes on. And, and he says, uh, he comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given to us. We are comforted by God. And because we are comforted by God and we have that source, that then becomes the reason why we can begin to comfort others. And then the experience of comforting others as we do it, it helps them through their troubles. Do you realize that people are having trouble? The, have, you, have you noticed that life isn't perfect and it's filled with pain and sorrow? And you think of the troubles that are coming from the outside and then how many people are troubled from the inside with different things. Uh, things like depression, things like low self-esteem, things like addiction. And these, these many times are self-inflicted wounds, and yet they're still wounds that need to be comforted. There are things that happen in people's lives, and they're looking for comfort. One of the greatest things about knowing God is the comfort that he gives. 
Even when you lay upon a bed on which you will die, you are comforted by who God is in your life and in your heart. If you've ever saw anybody pass from this life to the next who doesn't know Christ, it's a sad moment. It's a hard moment. It's a moment that's void of hope and void of praise. And it's awful. And yet, if you've ever watched a saint pass from this life to their reward, you see the amazing comfort of God, the amazing difference. There is a, a dying grace that comes into every saint's heart at that point. And there is a settledness. It doesn't matter how they have thrashed in pain and what they have gone through, but at that, those last final moments, there is the grace that only God can provide. And as he provides it, there is this joy. And you can tell. You can tell there is a joyful spirit, a spirit of hope, and when it leaves the body, all that is left is the earth suit that lays there. And they're gone. You know, in funerals, have you ever seen people walk by the casket and they go, he looked good. He looked really good. They did a nice job. Don't ever say that. He looked like a, a wax figure in, in the wax museum. You, you can't look, you look dead because the life is gone. The comforting God, the Holy Spirit of God, is, is emptied out of that body. That simply is the earth suit God gave you to walk around in. And so the, the joy of knowing, even, even in that, as you view a loved one who is gone, and you know they're no longer there, and you think, wow, the majesty of that, the comfort that comes from that, the comfort that comes from knowing that when you lose somebody, you don't lose them. Anybody that's in Christ is never lost at death. <laughs> they are more easily found than ever because they are found in the presence of God, and they now live forever with him. But it also talks about, Paul talks about, hey, you know, we're going to comfort you with the same comfort that we've been comforted with. Well, where does all that come from? It comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. As we went through Ephesians, that was the main thing that, that Paul talked about. He talked about walking in the Spirit. He talked about being in the Spirit every place he went because when you are in the Spirit, you are in the presence of God. When you're in the presence of God, you, ha you understand your Emmanuel is with you, and he empowers you to do the work of ministry. And so we are comforted in that way. Let me give you an illustration. I remember, and I've told this before, but it's worth telling again. So pretend you forgot it if you remember it. But I was in line, and I remember when it was, it was March. It was during March Madness, which also got canceled this year. But I'm not bitter. Uh, but I was hurrying to get home to March Madness, and so I had two little things of Sherbert. And I'm in the speed-up line, right? And this lady's in front of me, and it comes time for her to get her credit card out and pay. And the guy behind the deal said, ma'am, do you, do you want to put your credit card in? And she kind of was stunned, and she looked up, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And she fumbled around with her purse and knocked her purse over, and a bunch of stuff came out. And then she gathers a credit card and, and slides it through, and, and, and it, it doesn't work. And she, she does it again, and she's got it backwards. And, and the guy's kind of looking at her like, you know, and, and the guy behind me is kind of looking around like, what's taking so long? And I'm looking at her, and, and he says, I'm sorry, man, just turn it over, okay, and then slide it through, and about then she drops it. Now, I'm, I'm starting to worry about my sherbet. I'm thinking, do I need to go back and get fresh sherbet? So I'm sort of feeling it. <laughs> she bends over, picks the card up, turns to me and looks right at me and says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I've just been diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. And I'm like, what am I going to do with that? You ever think, you know, you look, at, you look at pastors and you think, oh, they got all the answers. Or you look at somebody who has a counseling ministry, you think, guy's got all the answers. My answer was, 
I got Sherbert. I just want to go home and watch a game. And she's telling me she's got stage four cancer. And I, I'm kind of looking at her. The guy behind me goes, forget it. He goes to another line. And out of nowhere, a woman steps from behind him and she walks up and puts her arm around the lady and takes the card away from her and swipes her card. And she said, who's your doctor? And she said, tells her who her doctor is. Oh, she said, oh, good. That means your oncologist is Dr. So-and-so. And she said, yes. And she said, well, are you scheduled to go on Tuesdays or Thursdays? Because those are the two days you go. And she said, Thursdays. And she said, okay. And she looked at the guy and she said, put her groceries aside, put my groceries aside. She said, you and I are going to talk. She said, you have my doctor. You have my oncologist. I've just been told that I am cancer free after four years. And I'm now your best friend. You will not go to another time with the doctor without me being there with you. And she walked over and they sat down and they talked. And she asked her, does your husband know yet? And she said, no, I, I haven't been home. And, and she wrote out the number of her husband. And she said, he'll be glad to meet with him and talk with him. He can help him. And I watched them cry, I watched them hold hands, I watched them pray, and I thought, there's the comfort of God. Amen. That's when God has somebody on somebody's life, and that's Christmas all year round. And that, that woman had the skill from God, the comfort by which she had been comforted. I'll guarantee you, somebody else comforted her, had comforted her through her journey through that. And now this was somebody fresh and new God was giving her. And they were going to go through this thing together. And I, I kind of smiled when she said, I'm your new best friend. I also thought about my grandmother. We called her Granny Goose. I probably have more development from her than from anybody else in my life because she was my daycare. My mom would go to work and she'd take me and my brother and slow down to 35 and kick us out at, at, at Grandma Goose's house. And, uh, and my grandpa had died when I was four, which my little four-year-old heart broke because I was obviously his favorite. And, and I, he was the only one that I was the favorite. I hated losing him at four. And my grandmother, they had just a few acres, and she had a little white house, and then there was another one here, another one here, and some space there where the chickens were, and then another one in the back, and then a field where she grew vegetables and things. And so I got to work and be around her, and she is the sole person, if you, if, if you hear me and you think, he crazy, he silly, it's my grandmother. My grandmother was one of the most hilarious people you would ever want to be around. And, and Kansas tough. Dodge, Kansas. The youngest of 11 kids. Strong. And, and strong in personality and strong in faith. And I remember she had a sewing group. I didn't even know what that was. I knew she didn't sew. But she had a sewing circle. I knew during the sewing circle, Larry and I had to go outside, play with the chickens run through the field, do whatever we we're going to do, but we couldn't be in there with a sewing circle, and these little women were in there, and it was obvious that my grandmother was physically the strongest among them, mentally the strongest among them, probably spiritually. And I remember as their husbands would get ill and go into the hospital or their husbands would die, my grandmother would throw us in the car, and we would go over to the home, we wouldn't go visit the person. We would go visit the home. And she would clean the house. And she would give us assignments like shine those shoes and make those beds. And one of the things that she always said when we'd pick her up every Sunday for dinner, we'd go by to get her, and uh, she would always close her door and lock it. And I said, everything okay in there? And she said, yep, I left her dying clean. And that was her ministry. That was her comfort for all those women. She would go and she would take care of things so that when they came home, the home was left dying clean. 
and there was food to eat. There wasn't anything for them to do. And so you, you learn by you watching people who know how to give care, people who know how to give comfort and what it looks like. And you can tell what it feels like to the other person. That's really the Christmas spirit. That's really what it is. It's comforting people. It's our opportunity to jump out into the world that needs hope and offer hope because we know that Jesus came. This is what we're celebrating. That's why when you're in Target and a little guy says, Happy Holiday, you just look back and go, No, Merry Christmas. And he kind of goes, Yeah, Happy Holiday. And I go, Merry Christmas. And he'd say, hey, Happy Holiday. You know, I said, Yeah, I know you work for Target. You can't say Merry Christmas. But you can go to any bathroom you want to go to. Please let me know you know it's Christmas. Kid will nod his head. And then I'll leave. I'm a pain at Christmas. We're supposed to be. You know what's fun to do at Christmas? It's fun to, to drive around till you find a really close parking space. Okay? And pull in and then put your car in reverse and just sit there. <laughs> Wait until you've got a big long line of people and then put it in park and jump out and go, Merry Christmas! It's a wonderful response you'll get. Try it. That's uh, one of the things I hate. You can't do stuff like that online, right? You can't provide comfort online. You have to be out with the people to provide comfort, to be there for them, to help them, to watch them. I mean, now, you, I mean, you see the thing? They got, they got uh, Santa in a snow dome so the kids can go up and get their picture made in front of the snow dome. And I'm like, hey, if you've got to work that hard at it, tell them who Santa really is and share Jesus with a little kid. So, so the, God is the God of comfort, and he comforts us, and we are to comfort others. That's the reason why you've been comforted. And so many of you know what I'm talking about, because so many of you are built like this. So many of you have people on your mind and on your heart, and you worry about them all the time, and you just want to provide comfort for them. And as you think about that, and you think that that is the exact heart of God, he longs to comfort our world. He longs to, to step into the midst of the, all the trouble and the pain and the confusion and the chaos that our world provides, and God wants to come in and bring reason and hope and comfort. And he wants to use you in doing that. I think it's interesting, a little later in chapter 2, uh, Paul writes about smells. Don't you love the smells of Christmas? I mean, if, if you get in a bind and you hadn't finished your Christmas shopping, what do you do? You go buy perfume or some kind of cologne because that, that sort of finishes it off. And, and they're all the cologne commercials now, right? And there's going to be more cologne given because you can order that from Amazon and get it shipped and, you know, call it done. And it's a little package and all of that. And, and the smells of Christmas are so important. You know, you, you love to walk into a house and smell a real Christmas tree. And if you're like us and you've got a phony Christmas tree, you, write, you light a Christmas candle that smells like a Christmas tree. So that the smells of Christmas are there. You know, the smell of a, a warm turkey, the smell of pumpkin, all those things that, that you love at Christmas that, that bring back memories about Christmas are fun. Christmas is filled and, and the, the air just wafts with all sorts of smells, just a plethora of smells. And, and uh, Paul is going to use that as an analogy. He's saying the fragrant fragrance of a Christian. Uh, he says, our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God, but the fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. It, Paul is saying there's two kinds of people in our world. There are people that are saved, and there are those that can be. And until they are, they are the perishing, and you are the saved. And he is saying that Christians have this fragrance, and it's an allegory. You, Christians really don't smell. We smell like everybody else. Matter of fact, you can't say that Christians always smell good. I've smelled some stinky Christians. Right? I've been, I've been down there in the, you know, in the line with some stinky guys who knew the Lord. 
So there, it's not about what you physically smell like. It's what you give. And look at the interesting thing, that our lives are a fragrance not to anybody else. They are a fragrance that is rising up to heaven. They are a fragrance to God. You see, when you begin to be that person of comfort, you begin to be that saved person that God has called you to be, and you begin to walk in the Spirit and, and have the sense of Christ in you, the sense of Emmanuel as you make your way through the holiday, what ends up happening is you end up being special to everybody that knows Christ. They enjoy your presence. And you, enjoy, and, and, and you end up being a bit of a pain for those who don't. And that's okay. It sounds paradoxical, but the perishing need to be confronted with the gospel. He says, to those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. But those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. And who is adequate for such a task as this? You see, the fragrance of a Christian is the smell of heaven to those who are without Christ. And they scream they're allergic to it. It is believing and giving the life witness that you have. This is the greatest time of all, of all the times in the year, of all the seasons that we have, this is the greatest seasons for you to be that fragrance, that, that joy of God, that comforting heart, that person who, who understands what the season is truly about and not the one who is perishing. I am in pain for those who are perishing around me. And we all should be. Uh, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 2.17, it talks about the opportunity of Christmas. This is a great reminder that the preaching of the gospel has eternal consequences. And to preach it without, and we are to preach it with sincerity and authority. A sincere heart that preaches the gospel is a heart that knows the gospel. Those who know Christ can preach the gospel because they know him. It's personal. It is who you are. It is your testimony. You know, people can, can argue theology with you, but they can't argue your testimony. You own it. Whatever you say it is, that is what is true. When you say, my God is the way, the truth, and the life, and, and I am filled with hope and glory, and I know at the point of my death I will be in the presence of God. Nobody can argue out, out, argue out of that because that is your truth. That is your reality given to you by God, Emmanuel. That is his presence in you. And as you share that, it has eternal consequences. Those who are perishing aren't those people who are like, get away from me. That's not all who they are. Many perishing people are being attracted toward you during this time. People who are perishing need comfort. They need people to come alongside to love on them in their time of trouble and trial. They need to be comforted by the one who knows the great comforter. He says, you see, we are not like the many hucksters. <laughs> Isn't that a funny word? I had to look up what a huckster was. I knew that's not good. But what a huckster was, back in the day, they, you know, instead of shopping malls, they had like what we call flea markets. We get all excited, right? Ooh, there's a flea market. I'm pulling in, you know. And you get all jazzed over a flea market. That's all they used to have. Matter of fact, when you go over to Israel, they got malls that you can, you can go see. Ancient malls that they've dug out of the ground, excavated. And you can see markings where that person had a stall and the next person had a stall. And they were like stores. And, and you would put your trade out there, whether it be food or garment or whatever it would be, you would put it out there. We just had a craft fair, and, and everybody had a tent or a little spot or a little place, and it was assigned. And you stayed in your little spot, except for Paul. He wandered around the whole day. Uh, 
you stayed in your little place because your stuff was there. Well, a huckster is somebody who comes in on the side. Who, while you're in there shopping, go, psst, psst, I got, come here. I got the same thing over here for less money. Come here, I got, I got this for you. Matter of fact, hucksters used to sell food to the poor. And what they would do is they'd, they'd do the same thing that people were doing in their little stalls, except they would water everything down and they'd make it weaker so it would go further, and those were the hucksters. And I was studying this, and I, I was at racetrack gassing up my truck, and this guy pulls up like it's an emergency, rolls his window down, and says, Hey, man, he said, we install theater packages. And he said, the strangest thing happened. We just finished our last installment, and we got a whole theater package in the back here. He said, how would you like to buy it for like, like a deep, deep discount? And I said, you're a huckster. <laughs> and he said, what? And so I was explaining to him what a huckster was. And I said, I don't know where you got that thing. I don't know if you found it. I don't know if you stole it. I don't know where it came from. But you're a huckster. Whatever name's on it's not true. You can go to New York. You can buy Gucci. You can buy all kinds of designer stuff down on this one little street. You can get a Rolex. It'll turn your, it'll turn your wrist green if you wear it long enough because it's a huckster. It's not the real thing. And so Paul is saying, you see, we're not like many hucksters who preach for personal profit. We preach the word of God with sincerity and with Christ's authority, knowing that God is watching us. Now is not the time, your culture is not the time, for you to water down the gospel so it becomes comfortable for your society. We have spent decades now trying to make the gospel pliable pliable to what people would think so that the crowds would come in, so that the crowds would grow. It'd be more acceptable to say things like, well, yeah, yeah, I know you don't see Jesus the same way we see Jesus, but that, that's okay. You got your own Jesus. You got your own personal Jesus. That's okay. It's whoever you conceive God to be. So every athlete that hits a home run is, you know, doing that. And you want to stop and say, who's your Jesus? So I know the one true God, the God of all comfort, the Emmanuel. The one we celebrate at Christmas is real. And, and we preach now, but we preach with a, with a sense of sincerity. You know, the, the one reason why I preach verse by verse, book by book, is because I don't want you to get my opinion of anything. I want you to get the Bible. I want you to understand the authority in which God speaks through his word and how he has prepared it and saved it by the power of the Holy Spirit so it can be preached with power and, and dynamic. And really, that's the only message the world needs to hear. Any other message is going to fall flat. It already has. It is worthless. It would be like you having the cure to a, a terrible, terrible disease, and you sort of kept part of it to yourself. Because you didn't want anybody else to really get well. You didn't want anybody else to really have it. That's why when we look for a medicine now that will cure COVID-19, it sickens me to see people play politics with that. The idea should be get it as quickly as we can to as many people as we can to save as many lives as we can. That's the comforting thing to do. And it doesn't matter how much money you're going to make. It doesn't matter what that's going to look like. What matters is that the people need what you can produce. And that's the gospel. And we're to do it with sincerity. And we're to do it out of the authority of the word of God. Bonhoeffer, the great theologian, Russian theologian who killed in a concentration camp for his faith. The great Bonhoeffer wrote one time, he said, it amazes me how our culture is so interested in what scripture says to them and what it means for them. To really understand scripture, he said, you must ask yourself the question, what does this mean to Jesus? Jesus. 
What does it mean to the holy God that I love and serve? And whatever it means to him, it needs to be reproduced in my life. That's the presence of God. That's the essence of Christmas. The idea that Christmas is just tinsel and trees and presents and good food and all that, and all that is great and nice and fun. And you do need your two front teeth. You look better with them than without them. But that's not all Christmas is. That's just a part of of what, the, what we do in the way of celebration. Christmas is the celebration of the Advent, to recognize that there's hope, there's peace, there's joy, there's love. There's Jesus. An expecting God that is coming again. And we are so excited. We are like as what Isaiah would say, God, we are the potter. You are the potter, we are the clay. Mold us and make us into whatever it is you desire for us to be. We present ourselves in hope to glory so that God can take our lives and mold and make them what he sees fit so that we can become his ambassadors, so that we can become his witnesses until he comes again. That is the essence of Christmas. And all I want for Christmas is to show his presence. All I want for you this Christmas is to show his presence. You won't find it on Black Friday. You won't find it on whatever Monday's called. You won't find it out there. Find it in here. As you seek the heart of God, to heal your heart and to become your Emmanuel, then and only then will you find the essence and the glory of Christmas. Father, bring us to that knowledge that we might not be the hucksters that are only interested in the physical things of Christmas, but God, we that know you would become your witnesses for Christ, for the Emmanuel, the God with us, Father, you to be in our presence and to find your presence and your way into those who are perishing. Father, you are the God of all comfort and we thank you for the comfort we have received. And I pray, God, you give us opportunities during this season to comfort the lives of others. Even as we sit here today, all of us know somebody in pain. We know people suffering. We know people at death's door. We know people hurting because Christmas is an unhappy time. Not a time of joy, but a, a time of bad memory. Father, I just pray, Lord, that we would become your ambassadors. That we would become so Christ-like in our walk. That who we are becomes a Merry Christmas to a world that needs to see hope. In Jesus' name. Amen.